Today I'm going to talk about the experiences that I've had with a group of collaborators teaching data intensive science in the environmental biology curriculum. And so I feel like I'm a little bit of a sort of an oddball here in that I'm not, you know, focusing specifically on mathematics. Um, but I've been really sort of heartened to hear a lot of talk about the importance of data synthesis, the importance of data intensive research just in the discussions we have here. In fact, I don't see Carlos, but Carlos actually gave my introduction slide yesterday during one of his comments talking about the progression of scientific discovery back through um, you know, traditional observational and experimental study that then had theoretical research coming into it. And, you know, at some point, uh, you know, a few decades ago, we were able to start doing things with computer simulations of natural phenomenon. But now we have what people have called the fourth paradigm of data, of scientific discovery, which is data intensive research. Now, it's important to note um, that none of these progressions then precludes the importance of earlier types of research. And so it, it's simply a new way of doing science, and it's, it's a way that's very exciting, and I think a way that's very relevant to what you're talking about here, because most of the problems um, that we're dealing with, and I, I snatched these slides from Bill Michener, so I have to give him a shout out, because I love this slide, just showing not just that these environmental problems of the Earth are happening on really large scales, but that people care about them, and it's a topic of great interest, and that people are demanding the, the answers to these very, very difficult and complex questions. And how are we going to answer those questions? And I think one of the ways that we end up having to do it is using data-intensive approaches. So as I was trained as a traditional ecologist, and I thought of data in terms of data sets, you know, you go out and you collect a data set, now I think about data in terms of data streams. And there are lots of data streams that are constantly coming in that we can use to understand the ecological world and the environment around us. And I like um, this slide because it shows that, you know, there's kind of this pyramid and at the bottom we're getting the greatest spatial coverage from things like remote sensing, but the least amount of process knowledge. And as we move up this pyramid for all these different types of environmental data sets, we sort of get less spatial coverage for each uh, data stream coming in, but more and more of what's actually going on, the mechanisms and the processes. Um, the volunteer and education networks, now more widely known as citizen science, having these huge sort of human observation networks. We have long-term networks of study sites where we're collecting more rigorously uh, collected protocols, intensive monitoring sites. And on top of that, I like to put traditional observational and experimental studies because the kind of mechanisms that people, the data that they collect, I think the intersection between these sort of small scale mechanistic data sets and these large scale data sets is the really exciting part of doing data intensive environmental science. So you want to often use the kind of information that's collected here to make large scale predictions that you can test. So um, what has my role been so far in terms of bringing data intensive science to undergraduates? Um, I sort of got involved for the last 10 years. I've been a research scientist at the University of Maryland. In the last few years, I've been a fellow at SUSINC. And as, my, as part of that, I don't actually have any teaching duties. Um, I've taught a few classes here and there, but it's not, it wasn't part of what I did. But I actually really loved teaching, and I was kind of looking for a way to get some teaching activity and started talking with some of my colleagues. And they said, well, you know, I think it would be really interesting for our students to hear about what you do. So I started working with them to develop these modules, and I started first in this ecological analysis class at Georgetown that I did that the first year in 2008. So it's been quite a long time, and I've been doing this for, I guess, this is the, uh, the eighth year that we're working on these modules. And then I started with conservation biology in 2013, and I'll definitely be talking more about the specifics of what I do in the class, but that's how I got involved. Um, and my goals in terms of what I'm trying to bring into the classroom is I want to expose students to the potential of data intensive research. Just let them know that there's this new area of research that they may not have even heard about. Um, I wanted to let them know what are the skills of a data intensive scientist. So if they 
if they were interested in this, what kind of things would they have to learn? What do you do when you're a data-intensive scientist? And I also very deliberately try to bring in information about good data management practices. Because I'm not going to talk about this a lot today, but this is something that's really important for anybody who collects data. When you get into data intensive methods, you have to sort of follow best practices. But for people doing traditional ecological science, they're not maybe exposed to what best data management practices are. And that's getting more and more important today as we're expected to share the data sets that we collect, even if it's a traditional data set. And there's really no history or of training students on how to do this, whether for sharing their data or even just using their own data. <laughs> so I always try to, try to talk about these practices and let them know that whatever you end up doing, if you go into science, these are going to be useful and helpful for you. So what I thought I'd start with are sort of what are the skills of the data-intensive scientist? What do we have to teach to students if we want them to go into this field? So again, I sort of am adapting this list from uh, Bill Michener, um, um, but sort of putting my own spin on it based on my experiences. So the first skill is learning to ask questions at large scales. Now obviously, for you know, when you're asking questions about planet Earth, those are going to be very large spatial scales. Um, but we also may be talking about long temporal scales, although not necessarily this long. Um, or we may be talking about what I call large organismal scales in terms that you're looking for patterns across a very, very broad group of organisms. And the so first of all, I'd say that we are, it's hard for students to ask questions. That's already come up several times, just that skill of how do you ask questions. And even as a classically trained ecologist, and I was trained as a landscape ecologist where you really think about scale a lot, we're still not necessarily trained to think at really large scales, because usually we don't have the data available to us to answer those questions. So even just changing the way you think and the, the scale at which you're asking your questions is, I think, something that takes a little bit of training of thought. The other important thing I wanted to point out here is that, and, and this has a direct connection to this workshop, is that when you're asking questions at these scales, I think it's really important to start with an a hypothesis, a specific question that you're asking. Because although data mining is very popular and there are you know, whole fields of data mining, you know, and I don't want to get into a big discussion on the philosophy of science, but data mining in particular is very dangerous here because there's a lot of data and you can find a lot of patterns. So starting with some type of model is really important. And for the most part, when you're thinking about very complex systems, these models are usually going to be framed in mathematical uh, language where you have very specific predictions that you want to be making. And so that intersection between mathematics and data intensive science I think is a really natural and should be a very strong one. So the next skill is what I call learning the data ecosystem. When I was a traditional data ecologist or a traditional field ecologist, I would go out, I would learn the plants, I would learn the birds, I would learn you know, the history of the site. These days, I think it's more and more important if you're working in a particular study system to learn about the people and the values of the people who live in that area. That's learning the ecosystem. When you're a data intensive scientist, you have to learn the data ecosystem. So not just how to search and find data sets, but just knowing like what data sets are out there. Like when I talk to people and they're saying, oh, I think I'm thinking about doing something about this, I'll be like, oh, I know a good data set you could use or don't use that data set, that one's pretty awful. Um, so just learning that system is, is part of the skills. But also, what do we mean by data? There's so many different kinds of data. And so just as one example, you know, this is showing um, the weather stations for uh, just a global network of weather stations. These stations collect raw data, you know, and you can get that data sometimes every 15 minutes, and those are massive data sets. But then groups like the uh, Oak Ridge National Lab will take those data and turn it into data products that you can use that are actually extrapolation model data that often people will use as their data inputs. So understanding these different forms of data and what does it mean to be using raw data versus a data product becomes a very important part of figuring out what data you're going to use. Um, you have to learn how to assess data quality, although I would say that everybody should be assessing their data quality. But it's especially important when you haven't been collecting the data. And I didn't really have good pictures for this. Um, 
Obviously, we want to learn to use good metadata, and there are programs like Morpho that help you do that for ecologists. I put a bunch of GIFs there from citizen scientists. I work with citizen science data a lot, and I work with citizen scientists. So whenever you're working with citizen science data, you always get the question about data quality. Oh, is that good data? Can you trust those data? And I think that's a great question. We should all be asking that question. Um, I always like to point out that the people collecting data for these projects are often naturalists who've been in the field for years and know these organisms very well. And when scientists are collecting data, it's actually their field techs or their undergraduates who may be in the field for the first time. So I never begrudge people asking about data quality for citizen science data, but we need to be asking about it for scientists as well. It's, it's also important. You need to learn how to manage and manipulate large data sets. This is an important skill that we do not teach students in the environmental sciences, especially in ecology and the biodiversity fields. I have nothing against Excel. Excel is a really useful program, and for some data sets, it's fine to use um, small data sets. But once you get to a certain point, you are not going to be able to manage your data with Excel anymore, which means you have to learn other data sets, and you might have to start understanding some of the basics of databases, like what is a relational database. There are lots of different ways of structuring databases and doing queries. And you, know, you, you need to learn those skills. And you very well may be working in a program like R, where it's all command-driven. So you need to be comfortable in those environments. These are things we're not tending to teach undergraduates for the most part. You're not collecting your own data, so you have to ethically acquire the data and credit your sources, that's really important. You know, there are ways of like taking data off the internet, just scraping it and sticking it into a database. That's probably not ethical unless it says on that website that you can do that. Um, how do we acknowledge this, uh, the people who collected the data? This is a real issue for citizen science data. And there are different models, and different models are appropriate in different situations. This is one of my colleagues, Karen Oberhauser, who's a leading researcher in monarch biology, who works with some very passionate citizen scientists, including her mom, and they ended up on one of her papers. And that's actually becoming more and more common that citizen scientists are actually ending up on papers. It was funny, yesterday when we were talking about you know, how reaching out to the public, someone said, you know, the public, they're not coming to your conferences and listening to your talks. That's not always true. In, you know, if you go to the Monarch conferences, half the people there are the citizen scientists who've been collecting the data. If you go to butterfly conservation conferences in Europe, we don't have butterfly conservation conferences here, um, at least not yet, um, half of the people who go to these conferences are the citizen scientists, and some of the people who are presenting their own data are the citizen scientists, presenting posters, presenting papers, publishing their own work. So citizen science, and I'm not here to talk about that, really can be transformative. But a lot of times people are, you know, the observers, and again, here's one of my acknowledgment sections for a paper I wrote using citizen science data. We need to acknowledge their contribution. And of course, most importantly, <laughs> you've done all this work to gather all this data. You need to be able to synthesize and analyze these diverse data sources. And again, I'm not going to talk too much about the details here, except to say that obviously a lot of the sort of classical statistics that we learned in school and are still teaching our students are not necessarily going to be applicable and usable in these situations. And once again, we may have to be using some sort of complex mathematical modeling that's going to be helping us really figure out what are we looking for in these massive data sets in a way that's not going to lead us to sort of spurious conclusions. And again, I'm not going to say too much about this, except for this is another great intersection for groups like this one and the data intensive group. We need the skills of the mathematicians and the statisticians as collaborators often to help be able to analyze these data. So having said that, um, I'm going to spend most of the rest of the time just talking about the experience that I've had and sort of the challenges that I had um, trying to bring this content into the undergraduate ecology classroom. And I'll say that, you know, when I started back in 2008, I really felt like there were no resources out there, and I just kind of had to make it up. There's no 
pedagogy. There's no, what's the scaffolding of what you need to teach students in order to be able to get them to the point where you can introduce this concept. Like, there's none of that. So I was just kind of flying blind. Um, but since then, there have been some efforts. And before I, I start talking about what I'm doing, I do want to acknowledge that there are other people out there sort of trying to tackle this issue of how do we bring data-intensive approaches, and again, not just data approaches, but data-intensive approaches into the undergraduate classroom. NCIS ran a distributed seminar that resulted in several um, learning modules that are up on TIE, if people are in, uh, which is teaching, oh, I can't remember what TIE means, but um, it's, it's a website where you can get uh, modules for teaching experimental ecology. Toads, Roads, and Nodes was this great project where a collaborative network of undergraduate classrooms worked together on a single large data set that was a nationwide amphibian monitoring set. And they actually got a paper out of it um, in a conservation journal with uh, the students as co-authors. AIM UP is a group that's trying to use museum specimens and databases in undergraduate education. There have been workshops on how to do this. We've got data-focused molecule modules on cubes now. And so there are starting to be some resources out there. But honestly, for people trying to bring these things into the undergraduate classroom, I would say we're at our infancy. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about what I've done. The first class I started working with was uh, this ecological analysis class, um, which was taught at Georgetown University. And I did the first class in 2008. I had one lecture, and when I started, I had three labs. Um, now I have just two. There were five to 15 students, so not that many students. And there was, a, again, a really steep learning curve for us. And just to give a little bit of the evolution of this class, which I think is kind of interesting, when I first started it, I just sort of introduced this idea, and the exercise the students had to do was just go out on the internet, find some data, download it, and do an analysis about something having to do with the environment. And it's probably not a surprise to anybody in this room that that was a little bit too broad and the students were like, ah, uh, you know, although they, they did some interesting things and I tried to help them as much as possible. So then I constrained the exercise a little bit more and I said, well, we're going to use this butterfly data set, but you can go out on the internet and find any data set about something that might be an environmental cue, anything. It can be anything that you think might influence the the these butterfly communities. And you know, this really gets to the issue of trying to teach students how to ask questions, right? Because what I found is if I gave them an example, like you could look at climate or temperature, or you could look at landscape cover, like is it forest or urban? And then those would be the projects I would get. You know, that they would just instantly glom on to whatever examples I would give them where I was trying to get them to ask their own questions. So I started giving them these nonsensical examples and said, like one of the examples I used was, well, you could look and see if whether it's a red state or a blue state or a red county or a blue county has any influence on the butterfly community. And you can actually go onto the internet, download a data set of red and blue counties, and look and see if there's any ecological effect. I'm not saying there will be, but you can just come up with that idea and go find those data. And people actually started coming up with some really interesting questions like, some of them were typical ecological questions, but some were things like um, education level, or they would ask questions about things like um, rural or, or urban growth. And in doing that, they would discover not only is there urban growth, but there's this rural decline. It's really interesting. The students would come up with really creative questions, but ultimately it was still kind of too much. So now the, the exercises I'm going to talk about today are really constrained to be about climate and butterflies. But still, within that large area of climate, there's a lot of questions they can ask. And it's just be kind of become more tractable, especially now that everybody has now restricted me to two classes rather than three, that we just need to do something that we can really bring the students through. So in 2013, after I'd had a little bit of experience under my belt, um, I brought a, I adapted the module for a conservation biology class at University of Maryland. And that's what I'm going to talk about more today. And the nice thing about this class is it's a big class. So there are 90 lecture students in general and about 40 who also take a lab. So some of the students are lecture only. Some of the students just take lecture and lab. And we do quite a few activities in the first class just to get them used to this idea of going to the internet and, and getting data and 
we exclusively use the Climate at a Glance website, which is a great website. It basically is a front end for all the raw climate data, those, those, um, those station data. And so I talk about the fact that this is an interface where students are going in and querying out in a very simple way whatever questions they might ask. And the activity we do is what we call climate myth busters. Not that we end up busting very many myths, but... <laughs> So I ask students, like, well, what are some of the things you've heard about climate? You know, just in the media, from your friends, wh wherever, it doesn't matter. What have you heard about what's been going on with the climate lately? And I just throw it out there and, and try to get the students to say some pattern. Like, a lot of them will start out with, like, it's getting warmer. You know, and I'm like, okay, let's try to be a little bit more specific. So, you know, I could even throw that out to you. Like, what are the things we hear in the news right now about climate in terms of patterns that are happening that Anyone? Higher intensity hurricanes. Yes, more hurricanes, more extreme weather. What other kind of things? Oh, well, the winters are terrible, so clearly there's no climate change. Right, okay, so that there are different patterns in the winter and the summer. How can you have cold winters when it's still getting warmer? Anything else? Like in the news right now? It's the warmest year ever. Another thing that people like sometimes bring up is like the drought in California is a recent thing. Like it's the worst drought ever in California. Those are the things I try to pull out of the students. And then they have an activity where they have to go to the NOAA climate at a glance, just looking at the raw data and see if they see those patterns in the data. And it's an interesting exercise because you know the raw data are really, really messy. Sometimes you see it and sometimes you don't. So I'll use the example. That, that people really uh, noticed the last class, which was the, the drought in California. So if you just go in and look at the, the precipitation, this is going all the way back to 1900. I see you just have a few minutes. Um, you don't really see that much of a pattern. Yeah, there was this one really dry year, but it doesn't really leap out at you. And that's because climate is really complicated. So it may not be the year-long precipitation it may be something a little bit more subtle, like when is it raining? And, and that's something that we often get to bring up with students. And sometimes we'll go back in and look at a different metric. So like this is a drought index for California. And you can see that, yes, it's been very dry for the past few years. And in fact, now this does kind of look like the worst drought in record. So again, the students are sort of confronted with messy real data. Sometimes it confirms what they've heard and sometimes it doesn't. And we try to talk about that because I don't really want to be a myth buster. And I, and I think the students get that. But the main activity is this activity where they have to ask their own question about butterfly and climate. And this is the actual slide that we show to the class. So they're going to explore a large scale question of how climate might impact butterflies. They're going to get the climate from that climate at a glance website. The butterfly data are from a data set I use, the North American Butterfly Association's count data. And in the lab, I have to teach them about butterflies. They don't know anything about butterflies. They don't know anything about birds. All these conservation biology students, they don't spend any time in the field. Anyway, that's a different story. Um, <laughs> so I need to teach them about different butterfly groups and some of the biology of butterflies and what might make them vulnerable to climate. I want them to ask their own questions. We spend the whole last part of the first lab just helping them figure out the question. It's the hardest thing they do is come up with a question. Um, then they're going to answer that question using the data from NABA and NOAA and present the results for their lab mates and hopefully learn something about data intensive methods in ecology. And um, this is just the NABA data set. Um, it's not really publicly available, so I always tell the students that all the research they're doing is novel research. And it's true. And I think, <laughs> you know, this is important because I think any, any kind of exercise that you would do like this, not necessarily with the NABA data, there is the potential for students to actually ask a novel, ask and answer a novel question in their lab class and get novel results that are not known to science. And that's not usually true in lab class. It's totally prescribed. We know exactly the results they're going to get. We know what they want. We want them to learn from those results. This is a little bit more open-ended, but in that way, it, it can be a little more exciting, I think. So here are some, uh, some slides from some of the students. Um, this is results from two groups. We spend a lot of time, everybody has to come up with three potential questions, and then as a class, we sort of help each group hone in on a question. 
Um, I'm going to remember the rock star uh, group name generator for the next time I run this class, because I think the students might like that. Um, <laughs> but sometimes students will come up with the same question, and that's totally fine. But what I'll do is ask them to answer that question in different regions of the country. And then we already have an opportunity for some meta-analysis. So these are two groups. Um, one group looked at species richness as a function of elevation and drought, and the other one was looking at butterfly abundance, and actually as a function of elevation and drought. They did this one in California, this in the southeast. These are actual slides from their presentations that they gave to the class. This group was working in Southern California, and you can kind of see the, the gradient. The blue dots are where we had butterfly data. They used a more generic map, but just shows you this region of North Carolina that they were pulling data from that has this steep elevational gradient. And then they just did super, super simple analyses in R. I explained to them that if they were doing a formal analysis, it would probably take more sophisticated methods. But I don't expect them to do that. We're just doing a little bit of exploration. And the interesting thing was, you know, this was one of the examples where students actually did find a statistically significant response. They often don't. And when they do, they get really excited about it. And it was interesting because there were some really interesting comparisons to be made. In California, it seemed like at high elevations, there wasn't much of a pattern, but there was at low elevations. And then you had the opposite result in the southeast. And even the direction of how drought impacted butterfly, off, you know, butterfly community responses seemed to be in opposite direction. So that gave us a lot of opportunities to discuss what may be going on. So, and in the last couple of minutes, I, I'd been doing this for eight years, and so finally someone was like, well, are your students learning anything about data-intensive science? And I'm like, well, I'm sure they are. I mean, duh. And they were like, well, have you ever done an assessment? And I'm like, no. <laughs> so I, I did an assessment, working with someone who does assessments a lot. And I did this in collaboration with Karen Gadan, who is the professor of this program. And the nice thing, again, about this um, about this class is that there are 90 students in lecture and we sort of have this lecture lab control. In the lecture, I give one lecture about data intensive science. It's a really broad overview of data intensive science. And obviously in the lab, they're doing this kind of very data intensive science exercise. And um, so we have that comparison. And so the first set of questions we asked were just questions accessing knowledge. Can you give an example of a large ecological data set? What are some of the problems you might meet? What kind of questions can you ask? What's the difference between R and Excel? What are some characteristics of a database? We did a little bit about code in R. And when you look at the results, I have to say, I thought that the, the effect would be much stronger. But of course, I was very naive. But you know, we saw some nice results. The pre-tests were pretty much even for the lecture only versus the lecture and lab. But we saw gains in both lecture only and in the lab. And the gains in the lab were about twice as much. Now, of course, my real goal here isn't to turn these students into data scientists. It's to make them interested in data science. So how do we do there? We ask questions like, well, now that you've done this, you know, would you sign up for any of these courses um, that have to do with data sciences and ecology? Would you ever apply for an internship? Are you, how interested are you in this? And it turns out that, that at least the way I taught this class was not the greatest recruitment tool for data <laughs> intensive science. And in some ways, like on reflection, I mean, I remember being really like, oh no. Um, Cause basically what this is showing is zero is no change in their interest. Pink is lecture and lab, and blue is lecture only. So if they're on this side, they're more interested, and on this side, they're less interested. On average, there was no real change in interest. But of course, some students were now like, uh, and some students were like, hey, that's really cool. And actually, that is what's supposed to happen. And I have to say, like, I used to be a field ecologist, and I miss field ecology. And most of my field ecologist friends wouldn't want to do what I do because they want to be out in the field. And that's what a lot of the students say. Like, they said some good things, like, OK, I kind of now know what big data and comp is and how complex it is. But a lot of people said things like, well, I don't want to work with someone else's data set. I want to go out in the field and collect it myself. That doesn't seem very appealing. A lot of them said, which I'm sure will shock you, that they don't want to do anything that involves a lot of math or analysis. So that was another very frequent, <laughs> maybe I stressed that a little bit too much. But just in asking the last question, and this is the last slide, um, 
I just said at the end, well, was this useful? What did you learn? And the blue again is the lecture only, the pink is the lecture in the lab. You know, most few, only a few people and only one person in the lab said that it didn't help at all or they just have no idea how to answer that question. Um, a lot of people said that they gained familiarity. It was interesting to learn about citizen science. They thought it was a topic that was important. They were important skills to know about. But kind of what was really important to me is a lot of people said, I've never even heard of this. I didn't even know you could do this kind of science. That was the most valuable thing I got. I just never even heard of this before. And about 20% of the students said that. And um, so that was gratifying. So I guess some final thoughts. You know, we talk a lot about data science. Data science is really trending right now. It's big. A lot of people are building data science centers. But at least in terms of the undergraduate ecology, biology, natural sciences, I'm not talking about bioinformatics, we're not really exposing the students to the kind of skills or even, you know, just this area of research very much. And if we were interested, it's not like we have the pedagogical approaches to go out and teach data intensive science, especially if you're not a data intensive scientist. You know, I think we've all sort of experienced the fact that if you're trying to get biologists to teach math in their classrooms, it can be kind of hard because they're not comfortable with the material anymore because they've forgotten it. Well, in this case, they never learned it in the first place. Um, and also, and this gets into graduate and postgraduate education, the tools that you need to do with data intensive science are constantly changing. So it's hard for me to keep up, let alone keep my curriculum up to date. So with that, um, sorry, I think I went a little bit over, but I'm happy to take any questions.